to be an opportunity to ask questions about applying to Imperial, and studying there, and what's it like. So without further ado, I'll start it off. Yeah, one second. <laughs> okay, <laughs> there you go. Uh, does that sound? Okay, yeah, I guess. Okay, hey, I'm Thomas. I'm a PhD student at Imperial. I started last September, and I'm going to talk to you guys about my field of research, which is called quantum information theory, which sounds a little bit heavy, but uh, it's actually uh, very understandable, I hope, this presentation. So let me start by clarifying two terms. By quantum, for the sake of this presentation, I just mean small things. Things that are as small as individual atoms, electrons, light particles, anything that's, say, anything that you can fit a billion of in a meter, if that gives you a kind of perspective. And by information theory, I mean a science that is concerned with the processing of information. It's become big with the advent of the dig digital computer. And one important question of that field of science is how can computations be carried out efficiently? And that means in little time with a small computer with high accuracy. OK, that should be fairly clear. Um, now, why would it be a good idea to bring those two things together, the quantum and the information theory? The reason for that is that people have reason to believe that if you build a computer from things that are quantum, then you can have certain tasks um, um, completed much, much faster than with a, with a conventional computer. And the main purpose of my talk is to give you an idea why it would be that you could expect this speed up. And the, um, the reason is that quantum things behave very differently from macroscopic things. And I'll try and illustrate the most magic property of quantum things to you guys with a game that I've prepared here. Um, yeah, so the game has actually, it's, it's about 40 years old. It's been published in a, in a journal in the 60s. Um, and it has the following. OK, so imagine two young petty criminals. I need two people to illustrate these people. Um, they are called Alice and Bob. And they are arrested for a small possession charge or something of that scale. And they're brought into prison into two different prison cells. And the detectives that interrogate them are a bit odd. And they decide to play a game with them. And in that game, each detective is going to throw a coin. And then each, um, each little criminal has to plead if they're guilty or innocent. And they win this game if they fulfill these criteria. So in the case that they both get presented heads, so that's, wait, let's, you guys show your names. Ah, okay. That's Alice, that's Bob. They're in different prison cells. And they are presented a coin. They have this coin themselves. And in case that they both get shown head, they have to disagree. So one of them has to plead guilty, the other one innocent. And in all other cases, they have to agree. So both be guilty or both be innocent. So um, let's have a few test runs just to get these rules into our heads. They're going to flip. Their, they're going to stand back to back so they can't can't see each other. So we flip a coin. And then they flip their coin. You don't have to do that. So. <laughs> <laughs> and it is uh, heads for you. So we see that Bob gets heads, um, and Alice also gets heads. And now they have no, to no. plead. Oh, actually, tails. Now they have to plead, guilty or innocent. For now, they just make a random choice. So say this. Now I ask you, would they win this game in this constellation, or would they lose it? Uh, yes. Oh, no, actually, they lose. Uh, do you see why? It's um, 
uh, Bob has heads, Alice has tails, so they have to agree. All the black arrows are agreement, but they disagree, so they lose. Let's have one more run, just to... Uh, That's okay. heads, and that's also heads. No, no, this is tails. Oh, these are tails. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and these are tails. Yes. Yeah. Now, what's this? Win or lose? Yeah. This is a win. Yes, it's. Ah, oh shit. It's this situation. <laughs> tails, tails. They have to agree. So we should be making the guilty, not guilty choices. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And now um, I would like you guys to spend two minutes, three minutes at most, to think about a strategy with which they can win this game in more than half of the cases. Is that cool? Can you guys? I mean, uh, there's many ways to do well in this game and uh, I recommend you to keep it simple, but just have a few thoughts about um, how you could how you could do well at this game. So from our, our perspective. Yeah, from the perspective of the criminals, so that before they go into prison, they can talk. They can say, "Okay, let's. If this happens, then let's do this. And if you get tails, then I plead guilty, and you plead plead innocent." Like that. Um, you win if um, if these conditions are satisfied. So um, both Alice and Bob get uh, a sign on their coin, either heads or tails, and then they have to plead. So they both have to say independently, I'm guilty or I'm innocent. And they win in case that they both get presented heads and they disagree. So that's this one. Um, first the detective flips a coin for them, and then they decide. No, there's no communication between the two. Yeah, that's very crucial. Thanks. Okay, let's say one more minute. Well. Okay, does everybody have an idea? Like it's Um, that's a Wait, let me think about this. So you're saying um, if either of them pleads, uh, gets tails, then they have, then that person has to say innocent. Um, okay, can you say how high the chance of winning is in this? Yeah. yeah, so if one of them gets a tail, um, but what about if they both get a tail? Then, then, they, then it works, okay, but if 
one of them gets ahead and does not plead innocent, then they lose. Um, that's, an, that's another version. Let, let's first think about the, the first one. So the first one says, yeah. so I think in that case you would win, in, win with certainty only in one quarter of the cases, and that's this one. Do you see what I mean? Only if they both get tails, you will definitely win. And in all others, they will make a random choice and um, win with probability. Yeah, it's a good idea. Okay, then let's think about your proposal. You say they should always say innocent. Beautiful, very, very good. Yeah, um, that is indeed the, the, this trivial strategy is indeed the best strategy that you can get. And many people have thought about this and it can even be shown that if you, um, there's a finite number of strategies that you can go and no strategy goes beyond 75, which is three quarters um, chance of winning this game. Um, now on this slide you see a word that's classical and when I write classical strategies that seems to imply that there's something beyond classical strategies and that's what I want to talk about now. I want to um, introduce a quantum strategy, so a strategy that uses um, properties of very small things. For that I have to introduce an experiment that a colleague of mine whom I work in the same office with has actually conducted in real life. This experiment, um, it's a little technical, so bear with me. Um, you basically take a light, you shine it at a, at a piece of glass. All these boxes are just pieces of glass, like special pieces of glass, but for us it's pieces of glass. And of course most of the light goes through glass, but he observed that once in a while there were pairs of single light particles scattered off in different directions from this piece of glass. It was always pairs. And these light particles flew off in different directions. And yeah, he even managed to trap them. We can think of this trapping as like, just put them in between two mirrors and have them bounce forth and back. And then he flipped a coin for each of these light particles. And according to the outcome of this coin, he would send each light particle to another piece of glass. So in this case, he got, the out he got tails for the upper particles, particle and heads for the lower particle and then he sends the, the, the light particle to that piece of glass that he, um, that he got <coughs> indicated by his coin. And out of this piece of glass, the light particle can emerge in two different directions. So in this case, um, he got tails and heads, and the upper particle came out in the, in the upper direction, and the lower one came out in the lower direction, and these blue arrows just indicate that they could have also come out in the other way, but didn't in this case. And when you do this thing, it seems random what happens. So you get a coin flip that's random, and it comes out in one of two ways. That also happens once in the one way, once in the other time. And then he did this experiment very many times. And now let's translate that to our little prison game. Uh, wait. Uh, there's a little animation for that. So this is basically our prison situation. Um, You make two light particles, and one of them he gives to Alice, and one of them he gives to Bob, and they get presented with that coin that in the experiment he flipped, and they send it to one of those two pieces of glass. 
and then according to which direction the particle emerges from that piece of glass that they send it through, they plead guilty or innocent. Do you see what I mean? <coughs> Can you ask a question about it? Um, yeah, I'll just try and talk through it again. Oh, very good, sorry. Um, these are just the pieces of glass. So an arrow like this means the one piece of glass, an arrow like this means the other piece of glass. And if he gets the, the tails, then he uses this piece of glass. And if he uses the heads, I hope that this happens now. It's mainly random. Yeah, then he uses another piece of glass. So, it, yeah, sorry, I didn't mention it very. That's just to indicate that it's different two pieces of glass. Um, in their properties. <laughs> so in, in, in the previous picture, you had four different colors. And here, you just have four different directions of, um, of arrows. <coughs> Thanks for asking. Um, and then out of these pieces of glass, they get a yes, no, or a direction, a binary result and that they translate into a guilty or an innocent, and this black box is supposed to symbolize a detector that finds out in which way this particle comes out. Is that cool? Thanks for asking. Um, yeah, and then he did that very many times. Let's have it run a little. I'll go to 30, <laughs> then we have to stop it. What you observe, if you have this run for a very, very long time, is that the quantum enhanced criminals win this game in more than 85% of the cases. <laughs> and that's strange. And these many digits after the comma do not come from the fact that I just wanted to have some digits there, but they come from the fact that people have actually conducted this experiment very, very many times and very many different groups over the course of 30 years. And they found that in such a scenario, you could win with more than 10% more than any possible classical scenario that you could imagine. In that they use very small particles, light particles in this case. As what? How do you mean? Um, the role is just to give them these outcomes that give them the decisions. Yes and no. Because um, it's like you, you let a machine do a decision for you. It's like when you ask a computer something. But instead of asking a conventional computer, you ask a computer that works with very small things. That is what uh, my next point on this slide. Nobody knows. Yeah. This property has, has been around in research for about 80 years now. And if you present me with an idea of what is exactly happening between those two particles, then you can book your ticket to Stockholm and collect your Nobel Prize. And it's the safest Nobel Prize you will have ever seen in physics. And um, so what could it be? It could be that these particles talk to each other in some way. That the one particle says, hey, yo, I'm going that way. You should go that way because then we match. But that can't be right because this experiment has been conducted with the two prison cells so far apart that it would have taken, um, that the signal would have had to travel faster than the speed of light between those two, um, two measurements. 
and that doesn't work with relativity. And so it can't really be communication that's happening between those two particles. But there must be something that happens on Bob's particle in the very second, not second, but like the very moment that Alice's particle flies through this piece of glass and decides to take the one way. And this property, we don't know what it is, but we've given it a name, is called entanglement. And entanglement is the most magical property of quantum systems, and it is why we think that quantum computers, computers made from such very small things, um, might offer an advantage over classical computers. And now, in this game, obviously, there's no use for this game. This is just a, a thought experiment to highlight that there is a difference between the world of very small things and the macroscopic world, the, the things that we see in everyday life. But people have actually thought about this very hard, and they've come up with ways in which a computer could exploit this property of particles kind of talking to each other. And by a computer, I mean just, um, you know, in, in our conventional computers, it's um, information is, re is represented as bit strings, so say 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and so on. And these are represented as voltages on, say, little cables. And instead of having these little cables, one could imagine having, for example, single light particles or single atoms or single electrons as these, um, as these carriers of information. And you would have to, have, have to find some, some property of these, um, of these little particles that can represent a two-level system. So, for example, you can imagine the spin of one of these, um, these little things. Um, and now let's get a bit practical. People have thought that, a, or people have shown that a quantum computer might be good for um, factoring big numbers, something that is very hard on conventional computers. It might be, it will probably be good for searching databases. And my personal favorite is it might be good for simulating big physical systems, um, which are <coughs> composed of very many little quantum particles. Um, that's what we call simulating quantum systems. So there has been millions of man hours spent on this topic, billions <coughs> of pounds, and um, we're still at the very beginning of this field. And I hope that by the time that you enter university, you will find a very different landscape. And um, yeah, that's pretty much the content of my talk. I think we should go over to Freddy now. Uh, yeah. Yeah, let's have a few questions if you have any. Yeah? Yeah, that's great. Like this? So that's loud enough? Oh, okay, great. Um, so I didn't know how far you were going to sit, so I'm going to come a bit closer first because I brought something. So I have three small bottles with me, and all three of them, it's mainly water, but there's small metal particles dispersed in it. And um, small, I mean at the nanometer scale. So I'll maybe quickly go to the first slide. So the nanometer scale, one nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So there's basically, and two of them, there's tiny silver structures mixed in them, like billions of them. And then one of them is there's gold. But maybe someone can have a guess. You can take them if you want to show, like, give them through. Like, in one of them, it's gold, and the two others is silver. And maybe you should guess in which one there's billions of gold, small particles mixed in it. The pink one is a good guess, but it's an awkward guess, considering that gold isn't really pink normally. But fine. Um, but so, what, 
what I'm trying to show here, or what I want to explain here, is that when you go to the nanometer scale, like one nanometer, 10 nanometers, hundreds of nanometers, so um, considerably smaller than everything you can see by eye, because I think the limit by eye is like a tenth of a millimeter or whatever. Um, the color of materials and the color of structures doesn't only depend anymore on the material that you're using, but also on the size and the shape. Um, that's quite weird if you think about it. Imagine you have a gold ring and it has gold color. You cut it in two, suddenly the color of that half a ring would change. That's not what you expect in normal sized things. The color of a car doesn't depend on the size of the car, it depends on the paint that you use. But then nano-sized metal particles mainly, it does depend strongly on the shape and on the size. And I'm quickly going to try to explain that with an animation I made in PowerPoint. Um, yeah, we can go back. So, and it's also not the most fluent thing you've ever seen probably, but anyhow. So let's do that one more time. So what we have, the, 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 red, the gold um, colored thing should represent like a gold sphere or a gold, um, in that shape, ellipsoid if you want, in the sizes that we're speaking of. So for example, imagine a 50 nanometer gold sphere. And the black balls that I showed on them should represent the free electrons moving in the metal. Um, and then the red sinusoidal function is light traveling across that particle. So I hope you know that lights are waves and lights have waves. The wavelength of light, light is around 400 to 700 nanometers, so really short too. But in the end, there's still waves, like you would make a wave on a rope. Um, and so what you see happening is when the light travels around the object or through the object, the electrons oscillate with the light wave because light waves are electromagnetic wa magnetic waves, so they have an um, electromagnetic attraction to electrons or repulsion, depending on the sign, and electron is negative, so repulsion. Um, and so what happens is when the light travels through this golden sphere that you have in the, the bottle somewhere, the electrons shake with it. And if that shaking happens at the same period, as the, the light itself, they shake a lot. It's like a swing. When you, when you push someone on the swing and you do it right, he's gonna go further and further and further. He's gonna swing a lot because he's in period with the person that is pushing him. I guess that makes sense. That's the idea of resonance. Because what happens if the light oscillates at a different frequency than the electrons wanna oscillate, or if you want to push someone that is on a swing, but you push him before he swang all the way out, you're going to push him not badly because he's still moving in the opposite direction and he's mainly going to wobble in the middle and he's not going to swing far back and forth. So that's what you see here. If you take the same size particle but the other light, and other light means a different color, different wavelength, this is what you're going to see. So now here, the electrons and the light moving is not oscillating in the same speed. And what happens is that the electrons don't have the time to make their full swing, and they're kind of stuck in the middle. And it's the movement of these electrons that decides the color that you're looking at, because it's the swinging of the electrons that re-radiate or that reflect the light that comes from the lamps. And that's why a different shape will be in, different, in resonance with a different wavelength or with a different color, and that's why even though you can have um, structures all from the same material, let's say gold, silver, or whatever, but a different shape and a different size will deliver a different color. And I don't know if for you guys that sounds quite unexpected or extraordinary. In a sense, it should, because like I said, that real life applications, things that you look at, it's the material. It's the, how the material is made on the atomic level that decides the color of it. Like paint has certain molecules or pigments in it, Gold, a golden ring always has the golden color, whatever shape you make it. But so this breaks down at the nanometer level because the size suddenly matters. The size and the shape matters. Um, this is a famous example. You can find it in the British Museum. It's a Roman goblet, and they kind of put similar structures on it. So there's a lot of, it's covered with golden spheres on top of it. And depending on if you shine the light from outside, 
The light that will be reflected is the light that is on resonance, so my first example. And because of this size here, it turns out to be green. In the second example, you're looking at the light source that comes from the inside. And now the light that you see is the light that is not reflected by the gold spheres patterned on the cup. So now you see red. So this just shows that the left side is the right wavelength, is the wavelength that interacts strongly with the gold spheres. The right thing is you see red because red doesn't interact strongly with the structure, like in this example. In this example, the electrons won't move much, the light won't notice anything, and will just go straight through. Um, so this is already quite impressive or interesting that you can tune the color of a material by playing around with this tiny shape. But obviously, there's more applications to it and more reasons why someone would want to do a PhD in nanotechnology and shining light on small metal structures, because the color alone is not worth billions of dollars or pounds that is invested in the research field now. So I'm going to talk about a couple of applications that have to do with this interaction of tiny metal structures. And they could be spheres, stars, long rods, whatever. They can be made in different modern technology ways. They weren't able to make them long ago or not in the same um, deterministic way that we can. And that's why the, like, this whole research of nanotechnology is popular or successful in the last decade. But so to explain the main applications or some of the cool applications of um, this field, which is called plasmonics, by the way, but you can forget that name unless you find this talk really interesting. Um, but so for that, I have to introduce really quickly something else, which is called the diffraction limit. And it just means that if you want to focus light with a lens or with a microscope or whatever, like, an, how do you call the, the thing that you magnify stuff with? If you shine light through it, it will focus down a spot like the sunlight or a laser or whatever. But there's always one rule. You can only focus it down to a certain minimum size because light are waves. And maybe that's a bit hard to get, but it, it just means that this is my drawing of a lens. However good that you make that lens, how expensive you make it, those, that minimum waste where the two arrows are will always be like there's a fundamental minimum that you can go to. And it's around half a wavelength. So that means, for example, for red light, what is around 700 nanometers, 650 nanometers, this, the minimum spot that you can focus light would be 300 nanometers or 400 nanometers. And now that sounds really small, considering that a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. But if I would compare that with a modern day transistor, a transistor is the basic building block in a computer or like in, a, in an iPhone, there's billions of them. A modern technology transistor in electronics and computers is around 20 nanometers. So if you compare the minimum size that I can make light with the minimum size that a, that a, a basic building block of computer has, suddenly 300 nanometers seems huge especially if you want to think about using light and some of the modern technology things. Because um, obviously, if it's 10 times as big and you want to use light instead of electronics, you don't want to make your phone 10 times as big to get the same amount of building blocks. Even worse, if you want to play around with molecules, atoms, all the really small things that become interesting in quantum systems or in quantum mechanics, they're around the one nanometer size. So imagine you want to play around with a molecule that size, with a laser spot that size. It's like swing a sledgehammer at a bird, uh, at a fly and hoping to see something interesting inside. Like, it's not really gonna work that well. Um, so now here we go back to the golden spheres and all the golden structures I showed you with the swinging electrons inside that interact well with the light because they oscillate like a swing with the light. Okay, this is a bit difficult maybe, but here you have just a sphere of 50 nanometers, let's say. Let's say it's gold. And what you see around it, so that's the, the dashed line. What you see around it is the light that interacts with the electrons gets suddenly squeezed closer to that sphere. So imagine that circle is 50 nanometers and see how close the light is around it. So the light is squeezed in a 50 nanometer spot, let's say, or a bit more. Compared to what I just said before is the minimum limit you can squeeze light into. 300 nanometers, 400 nanometers. So what we see here is that 
by making light interact with all the electrons and metals in really small particles that we can make with modern technology, suddenly you can squeeze light in way smaller places. Like you can push it together around golden spheres with all kinds of weird shapes that we can make nowadays. Like we can make, I don't even know the name for this, like it's three triangles aiming at each other and so the light will be squeezed in the middle or the light will be squeezed within this gold ring that is patterned on a gold glass with um, yeah, modern fabrication techniques. Um, and so it will be squeezed in a volume that is way smaller than before because this ring is, for example, 100 nanometers. So not only can you play around with the color of materials by making the size smaller of your metal object, you can squeeze light in a way smaller hole or in a way smaller space than you could before. And now, how much time do I have left? Another hub. So now the applications come because squeezing light into small spaces spaces maybe sounds irrelevant a bit, but it's not. There's loads of important applications to it. And the first one is optical antennas. So imagine you have something that emits photons, so light, like this. If it's an atom, for example, it will emit it in random directions and not really fast. So if we want to use these photons to play the quantum game that Thomas first introduced, for example, this would be slow, and if someone is standing over there, he will only get the photons that accidentally go in that direction. But luckily, we know from radio antennas, TV, satellite dishes, and all that stuff, that you can force electromagnetic radiation, which is light, but also radio waves, and everything you use to communicate. You can force it in a certain direction by making certain designs of structures. For example, this is Professor Uda, or Yag Yagi, one of the two. And in 26, they invented the Yagi Uda antenna, and they called it generation of short wavelength waves. So by making a certain shape, and in this case, a couple of rods next to each other, suddenly they radiate way more um, radio light, radio frequency, I think, so radio waves to communicate with someone else, rather than just having one rod by making the design. But so the problem is, radio waves are three meters long. So they're completely the same kind of radiation as light, but their wavelength is way longer. So the structures you work with, the antennas are big too. We can see them, like, in his hand. If you want to make the same structure for light, you have to make it way smaller to make it the same kind of ratio, light wavelength, wavelength of your antenna. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so that's what we can do nowadays. So this is, I hope you notice, completely the same kind of structure. Four rods, here it's five, but that doesn't really matter. But now suddenly these are only 200 nanometers long. And where the red square is, it basically says that there's a, some kind of atom there, again emitting the photons like I showed before. But what will happen now, by making a nanoscale antenna, it's quite impressive, like 20 years ago people would not have been able really to, do, to make this. All the photons, Oh, we'll go in the same direction. And even more, uh, they will emit faster than before. Yeah. So you will have more photons and they will all go in the same direction. So if someone else is waiting for the photons over there now, thanks to making it a gold, because this is gold, gold ellipsoid surround it, making a fa an antenna that looks the same like the antenna I showed first with the old Japanese professor, you get way more of it. Um, so that's one application. And it's really important if you want to do quantum communication, which means communication with quantum objects, to, for example, beat the classical game that Thomas explained first to make quantum computers, basically to do everything at a single photon level. And a single photon, like, single photon level means one photon at a time rather than the billions of photons that you get with, like, for example, a lamp. If you look at the lamp, your eye is constantly getting hit by billions of photons at the same time. Um, but here, at this teeny tiny level, suddenly we can direct single photons in a certain direction efficiently, thanks to patterning an antenna around it at the nanometer scale. Maybe an, oh, yeah. another more graspable example is cancer research. Um, so here, some researchers made 
a silica ball of 100 nanometer, coated it with gold, and they put it, not in real people yet, because I don't think it's at that stage of medical research, but with mice. So they put it in the bloodstream. And maybe you can see it on the picture over there. So these particles travel through the bloodstream, because they're that tiny, and they get stuck mainly in the cancer tumor. And now the cool thing is, if you shine light on it of the right wavelength, of the wavelength that makes the electrons oscillate a lot, so at the right frequency, the metal will heat up, just like your electronics heats up because there's electrons moving through your chip. So the metal will heat up, and what will happen is the heating up gold will burn the cancer tumor. And because the gold particles mainly get stuck in the cancer tumor, one, you're not burning anything around it. You're burning away the cancer tumor, like, specifically. And second, because you can make this resonate at a certain wavelength that is um, transparent for your skin, for example, here, near infrared, which means just through red for your eye to see, like, a slightly longer wavelength than whether I can perceive, which goes through the skin and would go through the tumor cancer, more or less, but it doesn't because it feels all these gold silica particles that heat up and that burn the tumor. So that's a medical application. There's, how much time do I have left? Um, okay, so then the next one is again more like color related or, yeah, let's say color related. So the pregnancy test is, a, is a, probably the most used example of, of the research field that, that is about small metal particles. Um, so I don't have a sample of that um, with me. But so this shows how pregnancy test works. So first of all, you can make gold interact with molecules um, because of the surface. So the molecules will attach itself to the gold surface. They will get stuck to the gold surface, um, but not to all molecules. So apparently there's a certain kind of molecule that will make it get stuck with HCG, which um, you only find in the urine if the, the woman is pregnant. And so in the other case, because that molecule is not there, nothing extra will get stuck to the gold particles, the upper example. So what you do is you flow the urine, you make the urine flow over a certain um, this structure, it picks up the gold particles in the flow, and if the gold particles have this extra molecule, they make it attach to the test line. Can you read it? So you, they make it attach to other molecules that were already positioned on the test line, and on the control line is basically to make sure that there was enough urine. So on the control line, there's another kind of molecule, and the gold will always be at attached to it if it streams over it no matter what, if the, the specific hormone was in the urine or not. So what you get is, if the woman was pregnant, you get gold particles stuck on the test line and on the control line. If the woman wasn't pregnant, there's no gold particles stuck on the, tes on the, on the test line because there wasn't the right molecule to make it get stuck there. And so if you look at the two stripes then, if both are colored, red, I guess, it depends, like I said, on the gold particle size, but it's, uh, it's probably red, um, that means you're probably pregnant because that hormone made it get stuck on the test line. If, the, if that hormone wasn't there, there's no gold particles on the test line, and the red color is not there because you need the gold particles to create that red color. Um, if both lines are in red, that means there wasn't enough urine to make the um, gold particles travel to the test line and the control line, and you don't know anything. That's why you need one stripe to know that the test was fine, and the second one to tell you if you're pregnant or not. Um, I can introduce a last cool, quite cool example, or really popular in recent, yeah? It's what is being used now. That's at least what they've told me. Um, but yeah, my professor tells me that's what the current technology looks like. Um, a last example that I'm gonna show is a bit more out there because there's not really 
real applications for the moment yet, but there's a lot of research going on in it, and it's invented by a professor at Imperial College, um, and he wins prizes, and he's Sir John Pendry by now. Um, so it's about metamaterials, and maybe I'll try to quickly introduce. So do you know Snell's law? Do you know that if light travels at an interface, it will bend, and depending on if the, inter the second medium has a higher refractive index, it will bend towards the normal, otherwise it will bend away, bend away from it. Now, I don't think you've ever seen a material like this in your, in your physics classes. So the light doesn't bend more away or towards the normal from it, it goes in the, the other direction completely. And this is what you call a material with a negative refractive index. If you would put it in Snell's law, you need a negative refractive index to make the sinuses fit again. Um, so this is quite weird. It doesn't exist in nature. And it doesn't exist in nature because the atoms or the molecules that, consist, that your material consists of will never behave in that way that it will create a negative refractive index. But we can make fake atoms or artificial atoms. Because why does light feel the atoms? No, I'll try to explain it. Yeah. So again, like I said, we can make structures. Like here, there are V grooves, but I've talked about the spheres. I've talked about the ellipsoids or whatever shape you can imagine we can make nowadays in the 10, 20, 50 nanometer scale. While the wavelength of the light we're looking at is 400 nanometers. So in one oscillation, you have a lot of the same. If it travels through a medium that is made of these Vs here, the light will see a lot of them at the same time, as you will. Like, because there's so many within one wavelength, for the light, this will feel like one smooth material, as if it was traveling through a normal material where the atoms are, are also in the nanometer scale, and it doesn't feel every atom sit like Separately, it feels a general material response. Um, a bit like infantism, where if you zoom out enough, this will look like a smooth painting. But if you zoom in, you see a couple of dots that should represent his moustache and his nose. So it's a bit the same idea. If you make something small enough for the light, it won't be able to see or to feel all the separate structures. It will feel a general material response. And because we can choose this shape. While we can't choose the shape of an atom, it's there, it has a certain shape. We can choose another atom, but it's still we can't really design the shape of an atom or of a molecule. We're, we're fixed by what nature has to offer us. But we can create structures in the slightly bigger 10, 50, 100 nanometer scale, but still small enough so that for the light, it will feel like it's traveling through a normal material. But with this difference that if we make these shapes, like if we make a smart choice in the shape, so maybe they have to be rings or maybe Vs or maybe something else, that the material will think it's traveling through a negative refractive index material. So it will bend in the wrong way. And I forgot a picture about that, but it's, this would, if we can make this, and we're not really there yet, because it's really hard, but this has a lot of ap applications, and the most famous one would be the invisibility cloak. So if you can make light bend in the wrong direction, you can also make it bend around an object, so that means you wouldn't be able to see the object. And so that's one of the most tantalizing examples of what you can do if you're able to pattern structures in the nanometer scale, but deterministically not mixing some chemicals and getting molecules out of it, but you decide how that 10 nanometer object has to look like. If you're able to do that, and specifically with metals, you can do stuff like metamaterials. You can play around with the properties of a material that 50 years ago, 20 years ago, would have been impossible to even think about. I hope I got that across a bit that that's the main reason why nanotechnology is interesting. Because you can start playing around with properties that before you couldn't do because it was the material itself. And now it's the shape that you're playing around with. Any questions? Or you said pink yeah, the pink one is, oh, I can, yeah. So the, the pink one is golden spheres with a diameter of 40 nanometers. <coughs> the yellow one are silver spheres of five nanometers and the orange, but that looks a bit yellowish. 
um, are silver triangles of 70 nanometers big. So two are silver with a different color and the pink one is gold, but the shapes are different. Anything else? Okay, then I can. Hi, can everyone hear me? All right, fantastic. So um, for this last part, I'm actually not going to use this, uh, this projector up here. I would like for you to all get up and come on down. I actually want to show you how we do a lot of this physics. And um, so the idea is, is that science is a massive industry, OK? There are billions of dollars, pounds, whatever, that go into this industry every year. And we have to have equipment that makes all of this work. So there are many scientists that are actually not doing fundamental research, but that are instead making equipment for other scientists to use, because otherwise we would be making everything ourselves and we wouldn't ever get anything done. So I have quite a few items here to show you. So first off, let's see if I can't get this open, guys. Hmm, fantastic. So what this is, is a commercial uh, laser diode driver. So what it does is that it controls the current to, like for example, one of the little diodes in a laser pen. Okay, and it controls it, you know, to six, seven, eight digits, something like this, right? So it's a very stable current supply so that we can make sure that we get the wavelength that we want. For example, the light that Freddie wants to shine on his nanoparticles. I'm going to pass these items around, so take your time, and when you're done with them, just throw them back on the table. Let's see here. So this is my personal favorite as far as optics technology goes. This is what's called an AOM, an Acousto Optical Modulator, a small little box. And you can see I have some tape covering the apertures. Inside is a crystal, OK? And what we do is we shine light through this crystal. We focus the light through the hole onto the crystal, OK? And what we do with that is we then put a frequency inside of this crystal. There's, there's a little connection here that goes to the crystal. And there's a transducer that kind of punches this crystal constantly at this frequency. And what this does is that we have these phonons, okay, so essentially waves going through the matter. And we have light going in perpendicular to it. And what it does is that it actually shifts the frequency of the light. Not only does it shift the frequency of the light in a, in a, in a, by a very small amount, it also separates the beams. So I have one beam coming out, and then I also have a family of other beams in the direction that we're pushing, okay? So I'll have one beam here and then another beam that's maybe, you know, 10, giga, no, 10 megahertz off and another one that's 20 megahertz off. And I get a different amount of power into each of these beams. And so I can use basically easy lasers, you know, so commercial lasers like a CD drive or something to make a frequency that I really need, but it's just slightly off from a diode. So I can keep it really stable with that device that I've passed around. And then I can shift the frequency just a little bit. So here, go ahead and pass that around. Let's see here. And then we have some other basic items that I should show you guys first. So you might wonder how we make this little, how we make the frequency that goes inside, right? So interestingly enough, um, there's multiple ways, and many of these ways are digital nowadays. We actually have chips that are called DDS chips, direct digital synthesis, and we basically use a register inside of a computer to make a very beautiful sine wave. But if we're looking for analog electronics instead, we can use a small crystal oscillator, okay? So it's an oscillator that's a certain size, and when you put power into it, there's another transducer that smacks it just the right way, and we essentially get you know, three, 400 megahertz coming out of it. And they're actually tunable by a little bit by just changing the voltage. So this is something that I would take a little cable and connect it to that, for, to that second device that I'm handing around. So go ahead, pass that around. All right. Now, the other, now, I mentioned that we have to kind of focus this light through, okay? And some of you may have seen some of this. So I have some basic optics here. So here I have a protected silver mirror, okay? Ordered from just a typical optics company, some bases, and then what we call a kinematic mount. So I can actually shift the, the position of the mirror slightly. So if I have a light beam coming in, I can shift its position by a couple millimeters up and down. And then I can kind of match X, Y, Z. I can, you know, if if this also had a rotation mount in it, I could rotate whatever this item is. So if it were a polarizer or something like this. So we also have to buy these. We don't make any of this. There you go, pass it around. Don't worry if you get your fingers on it, it's okay. And then here I just have a typical lens in a lens holder, right? So it's a, ver a, ver a very same thing. We would just put it onto a mount and focus the light through it at the, r at the center point of the lens. And we could then be able to focus it, expand the beam, whatever have you. 
There you go. Now you'll notice that on the lens, it actually has a special color, okay? It doesn't look like just a piece of glass. It's because it has a special chemical coating on it that we call an AR coating, anti-reflective coating, okay? And that's what's called B coating, okay? So it basically covers a certain range of light. That's um, about 600 nanometers to 1,000. So it's from, what's 600? Like, ye like yellow, green, something like this. And it goes all the way into what's far past what the eye can see, so far past brown. Now, so I also have a couple other fun items here. Um, we can make chambers, so these, these giant experiments, and they need to be empty. We need to remove all of the air from them, and they need to be very clean. So we can actually make things that are cleaner than space. Okay, we can make things that are cleaner than the upper atmosphere, cleaner than deep space, right here on Earth using these very simple technologies. So don't worry if you get your fingers all on this. This is what's called a Conflat. Okay, it's a company. Um, what well was a company way back in the day, like in the 70s from, from America. They make these knife edges here. Okay, you can go ahead and touch it. It won't cut you. Um, where essentially what we do is we take pieces and we connect them together either using these copper rings, which I'll also pass around, or these rubber gaskets made of Viton. Okay, we close them together with screws. And what they do is they, we just make a simple pressure seal. And this can seal to five to six orders of magnitude cleaner than space in, in, in our local solar system. And in this way, we can do very delicate experiments that we know for a fact air molecules won't bump into. This is one of the core technologies at the heart of cold atom physics. You know, so a large part of quantum optics or how we can make particles so cold by using laser beams, we can slow them down and then do precision experiments on them. So this is just a blank conflat. It would just be used to close off a port that we're not using at the moment. Or we would take this into the machine shop and put structures to put things inside of the vacuum. So I'll pass that around. There we go. And I have different size gaskets here because they come in all different sizes. This is a DN40, okay? They come as large as DN200, so you can imagine these giant gaskets. They have to wheel them in sometimes on, on carriages. There we go. In the Viton one, we'll pass that around later. Now, Freddie mentioned that they do a little bit of uh, product. So they, they, we have production facilities at Imperial that we use to kind of make these nanoparticles and make these nanostructures. And here, I actually have a chip that was very recently used in experiments. It's just a gold chip with, um, you'll, you'll see if you shine it in the light, that there's uh, three polished areas, and they seem to reflect all the different colors if you just get it just right, mostly red and green. Now, essentially what we've done is we've made gratings, okay? We've coated some gratings made into silicon, and we've coated them with gold. Okay, so we, so we have um, essentially just, a, just like an optical grating except on gold. And what we would do is we would shine light onto this, and what it would do is make a little focal point. So we shine light through, okay, and the center beam just goes through or gets blocked, and then the beam that hits the three little shiny points would come back, it hits, it hits, it hits these gratings, and it comes back, and it makes a little focal point right here. And using that, we could actually trap atoms inside of a vacuum chamber, right? So we have a little glass cell that's evacuated. We fill it full of the atom that we want in particular at a very low pressure, and then we shine a laser beam that's resonant, and it can trap a small little cloud of gas right in front of this chip. Go ahead and pass that around. Ah, I forgot one. So you might wonder how we see inside of these vacuum chambers, right? You know, if we have all these metal connections. Well, some very clever person who made a lot of money figured out how to put glass and metal together in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that binds it such that it's only glass and metal. There's no rubber, no plastic, no epoxy, nothing. It just seals right against the metal. So you can imagine these are very expensive. This is an old one, so don't, don't worry about it. But that's how we can actually see into the chamber and put lasers in. All right, so I see I have most of this stuff here. So um, I'd like to ask, guys, how much do you think um, a lot of this stuff costs? How much, how much do you think all of this stuff that I brought in is today? 30 quid. <laughs> oh, my friend, you are orders of magnitude off. Can I have another guess? No. Oh, this is the stuff's pretty expensive, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, all of this, well, uh, way more than 30. This is, this is, this is more like 2,000. This is about 2,000 pounds worth of equipment that I've brought in to show you today. You know, because, um, I mean, th well, this is how much the industry is worth, right? Because, I mean, yeah, we can make all of this very easily, actually, but it's much easier for us to buy it, right? Because government, military, industry, they all want us to do fundamental research to help the next generation of products, right? So they also make these products to help us do research and to do research themselves. 
So there's optics companies that supply these things like lenses, mirrors, the mounts and everything. You know where they, have, they employ full-time mechanical engineers to make these and also update the designs to keep them, you know, to keep them, you know, make them better and better, right? And then there's a whole entire industry separate from just physics. I mean, this is telecom and everything that makes devices like this. So the little oscillators and, and such. And there's the same thing with the lenses. Now, for, th now for this type of thing like this AOM, uh, this is actually quite expensive. This is probably about 700 pounds or so, okay? This is also used frequently in telecom, okay? We have a lot of overlap with the telecom industry because they also use lasers, to, for example, to deliver a lot of your internet speeds and this type of thing. This is the new way you know, to communicate across the ocean and such. You know, we have the fibers that go underneath the sea. I think there's seven now running between Europe and America or something like this, and they might be laying more. So yeah, this, this is about 700. This is about 500. Um, as you can see, it's, it's a beautiful micro, you know, with all microchips on board and this type of thing. Um, these, are, these are actually very hard to make and very hard to make well. So, it, so if you can find a commercial company that will make it for you and make it better than you could make it in a reasonable amount of time, it is better to buy, right? So you can imagine that most scientists are not actually engaged in fundamental research. You know, you go and you do your master's, you do your PhD, and you move on to say industry, for example, okay, or teaching. And when you move on into industry, you make these products that companies then come to you and buy, right? So there's many scientists that are actually in industry, in commercialization, in productization, that help make these products and help predict um, what will be needed in the future, what scientists and industrialists want, and further, um, you know, work, working with scientists and industrialists to kind of figure out what they need. Because there's many companies where, you know, they're 40, 40 people companies, but you know, they, they could be million, million pound businesses a year because they make five items a year. But the people that need these five items are willing to pay for it because they don't have the expertise or the time to make it themselves. So, um, this, so this is everything that I brought, and this pretty much covers uh, most of quantum optics. So, you know, vacuum technology, electronics, optics, and optoelectronics, this type of thing. And then also we do, excuse me, we do a lot of programming, this type of thing. So, so did, did you have any questions about any of these items or, or anything that I mentioned here? Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. You said about the protocol and the cause and everything. Yes. Why can't it be that off? Oh, that's a fine question. So, so in order to make it clear in the space, space um, you, you can imagine that that might be quite hard. It's a simple phrase, but it's very difficult. The thing is, is that after I've closed up a chamber, and it's sealed, and then I can pump all of the air out. Um, the steel inside, the way you make steel these days is they, they actually introduce hydrogen into the, into the uh, cure, uh, not the curing process, but in, uh, essentially what happens is hydrogen leaches into the steel when you make it at the factory, okay, in the forge. And uh, they do that because it makes better steel. But the problem is, is that for vacuum components, it also leaks out this hydrogen, right? And stainless steel is the best thing to make vacuum chambers out of after titanium, but titanium is expensive and difficult to machine. So the problem is, is that you close up this chamber and when you try and go to really low pressures, this hydrogen comes out, water comes out. If you left a fingerprint on the inside, you know, the, gap, the, the, the oils on your finger, they, they outgas and they send particles off and it just won't be very clean and it'll take you 100, 200 years to just pump it all out. So what we do is we actually wrap these chambers up in heating tape or we put them in an oven, literally. We put them in, an lar in a large oven and we bake them at say uh, 200 to 400 C for a couple weeks. Okay, and what, and what that does is that it, it increases the rate of gas evolution and it moves all of the particles out, you know, into the, into the air, well into, well, into the emptiness of the chamber rather, and they bounce around and after a time they find their way to the pump and it gets sucked out. Right, so that's why it's important because two to 400 C would melt most plastics. And it's better just to make a, make a, to make a seal that's just, you know, glass to metal and you seal it nice and tight and then that'll seal. Yeah, that, that's, so that's how we do that and why. Any other questions? Why is it so Well, that's a fair question. So, um, so, so let me go back to that same conversation we, we were, well, I'm sorry, is it difficult to make the seal or difficult to keep it clean inside? Is it difficult enough to use plastic? I see. So, okay, so the, so the, the other thing, um, the problem with plastics by comparison to metal is that over 10 years, for example, my plastic will degrade, no matter how good the plastic, right? Whereas the stainless steel, not so much. You might get a little bit of rust on the outside, but if you treat it well, it'll be fine in, in a lab environment. 
So that's also the problem and why we use metal, why we tend to use these copper O-rings when, when we're making good seals, because they don't degrade over time unless we have a caustic environment inside of the chamber, unless we you know, spray acid inside or something like this. So that's, that's generally why we don't use plastics. Anyone else? No, okay. Well, I'd also like to tell you a little bit about what it's like to, you know, be a PhD student, because you guys might wonder what we do, because the Big Bang Theory is not a good idea of what we do. So um, the thing is, is that, you know, we come in, you know, we, we, we come in at all times of the morning. You know, some people come in at 7, and some people come in at 11. And generally, we all stay really late into the evening, you know, between 8 and 11 also. And um, essentially, we come in, and, you know, we have to align up as an experimentalist. We have to align optics, test electronics. Um, we have to build systems. And then also, there's a lot of data taking, as you can well imagine. Think about all the time you may have spent programming. Um, you know, we also have to program. We also have to, you know, take the data, analyze the data. So play around in Mathematica, MATLAB. You know, really expensive, really fun software that has a lot of capabilities. So this is how I spend most of my day, and this is how Freddie also spends a lot of his time. You know, also running simulations on computers, this type of thing. Now, Thomas, on the other hand, he is a theorist, so he gets to spend um, a lot of his a lot of his waking hours um, at a computer, or you know, at a board, or in front of a piece of paper. Um, or with textbooks, as, as, as it were, um, kind of reading and collecting up the ideas that people have kind of laid down before him. And what he's doing is trying to figure out, you know, different, different mind games, you know, if you will, or, you know, he's trying to figure out different quantum algorithms for quantum computers and this type of thing. And it's not that experimentalists don't also do that. Um, he runs far more simulations than we do. He has a nice comfy office chair, this type of thing. You know, we're encouraged to be in the lab, you know, getting all of these optics together, this type of thing. You know, we spend um, a significant amount of time acquiring items, you know, so we have to acquire equipment. That actually takes some time. You know, um, we write grant proposals, actually. At this stage, you know, we're a bit young, but for, for some professors with their students, they do, they do actually write grant proposals and this type of thing. So you'll sit down and you'll get to write to the government and tell them why you deserve money more than someone else who's applying for the same grant and, and, and this type of thing. Um, honestly, it's a nice lifestyle. You know, I mean, because you, 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 you do get, you generally do get paid to do physical science graduate school, you know, so chemistry, physics, biology, computer science, sometimes mathematics, um, sometimes econ. You know, so you can, you can go into these fields and they'll take care of you as you try and learn all of these really interesting things. And there's also a lot of job support. So as you're going, um, as, you're, as you're on the out, if you will, you know, as you're writing up in this type of thing, there's job fairs and, you know, people will come to see you and, you know, even the people that you've purchased equipment from, you know, they'll come in and they'll get to know you and this type of thing. And one thing can lead to another. And many people do actually get jobs from companies that they may have purchased from or, you, or you know, they had to use for one reason or another. So it's actually a very interconnected industry and you can kind of just slide between many parts of, of, a, of a field and you know you can kind of slide all the way up the ladder you know from basic research up industry you know working in industry and then up to you know actually working in the at, you know at the at the board of trustees at, at some of these companies these corporations and all this type of crap so it's 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 pretty fascinating actually i mean tomorrow uh we have a guy coming from a french company who sells us optoelectronics so they make stuff like this actually more expensive ones and nicer ones at that and he's going to come in because I bought five of those from him. And, you know, he wants to chit-chat with us and see what kind of need we have for them and, you know, what else he can try and sell us. Um, let's see. And then in about a week, I have people that make these opto-electron, I mean, these opto-mechanics and these mirrors and stuff. We have people coming in because um, we buy, you know, oh God, 10,000 pounds a week of this stuff, you know. And we, we use it constantly. So they're going to come in and try and get some ideas off of us to see what can they make that we'll find interesting and then that we'll then buy from them. And they'll also give us free t-shirts and, you know, bags and stuff like this. So, you know, it's tit for tat, right? Um, yeah, so did you guys have any questions about that? About what it's like to get a PhD? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Every, I mean, it, I wouldn't say every student has a different budget, but different types of research have different amounts of money associated with them, mostly depending on your professor. You know, how many grants have, have, have they written and then successfully obtained? Um, so the professor that I work for has um, a lot of a lot of money. So we, no, so we, so we, so we spend a lot of money because we're starting new experiments. So you know we have spent a lot of money buying equipment. Like I mentioned, you know, just three weeks ago I was spending ten grand a week on equipment easily. You know, we're actually going to be spending far more than that as we purchase very expensive electronics and this type of thing. You know, places where you know you only three, four, five companies make this type of stuff. 
You know, so um, it, really, it really depends on the field. Um, in certain fields, you don't need that much money because what you do is when you're, when you're starting at the school, you get, you get a bunch of money pooled together to buy really expensive pieces of equipment. And then you can kind of move on with, ver with a very modest amount of money from there. Um, for, 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 for a lot of quantum optics, unfortunately, it is very, very expensive. You know, so there's a lot of industry money, um, there's a lot of government money, there's also some military funding, but it's mostly government science foundations and other kind of uh, private foundations that just give money to, to these enterprises. You know, so you write these long grant proposals and you have people come through, you interview with them a little bit sometimes, you know, and uh, yeah, then they can open up an account for you. I make it sound easy. Absolutely. And anything that is medically related has, has a lot of money. Yeah, medical, I would say yeah. pharmaceutical, so chemistry yeah. also yeah. to a certain yeah. extent has a lot of money. Um, that doesn't mean that the researchers yeah. get paid more. It like, does not. That just means they have more money to spend on equipment. Actually, so unless, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, uh, in physics at least, I think it's probably particle physics. Um, or, or, astro or, or astronomy or, and astrophysics because they, so there's a fine difference. All of this is um, what I would call tabletop, okay? As in, I can have an optical table, you know, the size of this table and I can do a whole experiment on this table and do fundamentally very interesting work. Now, um, particle physics and astronomy do what's called big science. In big science, no, 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 seriously, seriously, big science is, in is interesting because in order to get any reasonable results in anything that they're interested in, they need to pull together a lot of money and a lot of universities and a lot of people to get together and run telescopes. Um, you know, for example, there's a South Pole telescope that actually runs just a couple miles away from the South Pole, okay? You can imagine how much money that takes to not only put there, but to continue running. You know, and it actually takes so much data from the night sky that they can't send it all back over, over you know, the rest of Antarctica and then to the continents, okay? They actually have to do a lot of pre-processing there and they do a lot of data cuts and they throw out a lot of crap that they don't think they need and then they send it, and they send it back. You know, so that's, that's part of what big science does. Um, and then there's like, yeah, LHC, so CERN, billions, billions of euros, right, to, to build. Um, I mean, the thing is that it was so expensive that in the United States they were going to build something even bigger in Texas, of course. And then they said, you know what, we'll cancel this and we'll just put the funding into CERN to get that working instead because that's how expensive it was to build. You know, and the parts that they've built for CERN are astronomically expensive. You wouldn't believe the price tag on some of the things that they had to purchase because of the size of the device. You know, it employs thousands of scientists, still employs thousands of scientists, right? And then there's things like um, large accelerators at Slack, for example, like, like x-ray sources and this type of thing. And you know, they produce like two high impact papers every week is their average, right? Because people come in, it's a user facility. You come in, you get it for a week, and then you go back to wherever you were with all of your data if it works, right? So I mean, things like this also cost billions a year, you know, to run. So big science is probably where most of the money is just by virtue of it being incredibly <coughs> large. Do you think those people, they, they like struggle to get some piece of themselves? Of themselves. Do they get picked up on funds and stuff? Oh, well, I mean, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. It's just like you, you get money in advance and then like you hold some of it, you say it's an interesting thing, you say whatever it's not about. Yeah. And then you just convince somebody that you have a friend of how to find out about this. And then they say, cool, I'll give you money. And then it might work or it might not work. And if it doesn't work, then that money is not spent. But it's spent and it's some might say it's lost, but uh, it was yeah. worth the try. Yeah. Yeah. But obviously that the chance of getting money for an idea you have depends on what you've been doing before. Yeah. So a world famous professor that can show all these successes in the past will have way more success of getting the money. Mm -hmm. So if something fails, you don't get punished for it, but it will lower the chances of in the future getting money. Because obviously funding agencies, like the government rather gives money to a Nobel Prize winner than it gives to Dylan that doesn't <laughs> have anything to prove yet on his CV. So it's a bit like a working up way, where you're like, people always think that science is really non-political and it's all about data and like, theories and everyone is objective about how science works, but there's a lot of politics involved, there's a lot of name dropping involved and connections and like someone will 
like your publication and use your publication just because he knows you in personal life too. So there's a lot, if you want to move your way up in academia, there's also a lot of politics involved. So getting money depends on ideas, your CV, on the people that you know, and on the luck. The money. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Why do you think that's what I'm saying? Yeah, any other questions about this? Or Imperial College? No, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, how far away are you guys from university application? One or two years? Which are the hours? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, wow. Okay, so between three years from now and already submitted. And how many of you would be interested in physics? Probably, if you came here, you probably, yeah. 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 Okay, so, um, actually, yeah, I mean, that, that's cool. Uh, like, what do you expect, what, what, what kind of stuff do you guys want to do with studying physics? Is it basic interest, or is it you guys want to get a job with it, or what's this? Frankly, I think the department of education is quite good. So your first year you come in and you have to take the basic courses, of course. And at the end of your first year, you do a four to five summer project. Where, where it's, it's real science, science but, it's but it's also kind of fun. It's not like you're associated with any research group, group but your lab administrators um, get, get together, together and they all discuss a bunch of fun little projects that you know, make it really make you interested in really kind of get you thinking, you know, along the lines of, you know, science and scientific methods and how to really, you know, build something that you put together the results and figure something out. So there's computer simulation projects and there's building projects. And I mean, for example, one of the guys I work with is making a project using Arduinos. Where, where essentially you, go, you make, make a, a music synthesizer out of the Arduino like by programming, programming it with a couple of devices that you build in the lab. lab. So, so you, you come in and you learn a little bit of electronics and that other thing, thing. And, and you do the first summer project. And then, and then um, your, your second year is actually when you start the interesting stuff. So you start quantum mechanics and it's good business. And you get really confused for your year. It doesn't make any sense. So, and as you go on, you're almost in lab sequences. In which you essentially go in for a couple hours a week. You work, you work with, with equipment, equipment very similar to this, this actually, actually, some of them are exactly the same no where, where you, you can work, work with a lot of this equipment, equipment you get hands-on experience, experience with it, and, and you, you do a lot of classical experience in physics from, from oh, I want to say, 1800 on. You know, you know especially, especially during the quantum mechanics sequences, you'll get to do some really interesting stuff. So some of the real experiments really got people thinking, like, you know, there's, there's a problem with classical, classical physics, physics and we need to figure out what's going, going on because they started, started getting results that they couldn't explain classically. classically. And, and you, you do all, all of those major experiments. And you really, really kind of get, get to follow them in footsteps and you'll go because that's the way that we do pedagogy at Imperial and in many other institutions. So in your third year, you can then choose to stop and get your BSc, which normally again is a BSc project. So for example, I actually have two BSc students right now in the laboratory who are our own. Yeah, yeah, you can have you done that? Oh, that's great, guys. You know, so, so we have two BSCs that have a little obstacle table about the game, so we'll make people a bunch of holes, put them in, put them in. And essentially what they do is they made, made a laser. laser. Okay, bought the diagram and everything from scratch. They made a laser. And then, and then they, they have, have a little spectroscopy cell, so it's cell full of the two gas. And they shine the laser beam through that onto a photo detector. And they can see, you know, the way I like to say it, they can see quantum mechanics, right? Because you learn all this stuff in the books and you see the pictures, but they actually can see it on the little oscilloscope. You know, they can play with all the dials and they can see these curves that you see in books. It's like, you know, you're looking at this feature, which means the, the electron is jumping from here to here, when, you know, you get to see all these little energy peaks well resolved with your laser if it's on resonance and stuff. And that's their, that's their BSc project. The two of them have been working on it quite diligently, actually. So a lot of the BSc projects are like that, you know, or you can go into the actual department and do simulations or, you know, run some, uh, you know, run big data with, with, uh, with the astrophysics people or something like this, you know, there's something for everyone. And so that's the BSc. And then you can also stay for your fourth year and to get, to get your MSci, is that right? So yeah, you can, or MRES rather, or something like that. 
Okay, so M sire and res, and you can stay, and essentially you do write a master's thesis at the end, but it's uh, kind of a larger project than your BSc, so you do like a term of classes, and then you go on and for, you know, 30 weeks to 40 weeks, you do a project, at w you know, which you then write a master's thesis on, and then you can, you know, go, go on your way to industry, finance, whatever, or you can stay, and uh, you can get a PhD with us, or you can move on to somewhere else and try and get a PhD there. You know, it depends on what, on what you're interested in. Do you guys have any questions about that? Well, I think some of is going to come in at 6 o'clock. I think. Uh, we'll, we'll tidy up. Uh, okay. I'm going to get something to eat. Okay. Oh, before, before we sort that out, can we just say thank you very much one more time? Of course.